All right, guys, let's dive in. This is um, week three of our look at beacons. Um, so we've, over the course of, of three weeks now, we've been opening the Bible and we've, we've asked ourselves, where, it, where in the scripture do we see deacons being formed? Um, and why were they formed? What is it that they do? So we looked at Acts 6 quite a bit. Um, this is kind of the, the start um, when deacon ministry started in the early church. Last week, we talked about some qualifications for being a deacon. Some of, of what we looked at that, and, and some of what was said may have been slightly different than, than maybe ways in which we've grown up thinking about deacon ministry. Um, I, th I think this is good and this is helpful. We, sh we should always be open to examining our practices and our beliefs, not in, in, line of, uh, in light of, um, well, I guess, let me, let me backtrack. We should be open to examining our beliefs and our practices in light of God's word. Um, I think that's a healthy thing that we should be doing all the time as a church. So we're going to do that a little bit more tonight. Uh, but I, I want to start off with some some really practical, basically just some stories. These are stories that I pulled out of this book, which I highly recommend. It's it's called Deacons um, by a guy named Matt Smethurst. Uh, how how deacons serve and strengthen the church. It's really good. Uh, a lot of what we've talked about over the course of the study has been pulled out of this book, um, as well as this little booklet by a pastor in Texas named Juan Sanchez. Uh, this is called What Do Deacons Do? It's very short, but it's also good. Uh, it's not as in-depth as this, but um, it's still good. And we have a copy of this one, and then there's another copy out on the resource wall if that's something that you're interested in um, looking at yourself. Um, but let's look at some of these these stories. These are, are stories that I've, I've come across that are, are true stories of, of deacons that have come in and they've deaconed and the effect that it had on the church. So I want you to notice the variety of ways in which this can show up, um, but also I want you to see the similarities of what happens here too. It's, it's pretty interesting. So uh, here we go. First, first little paragraph there under uh, benefits of a robust deacon ministry. This guy says, I was still a rookie, 32 years old and only a couple years into my first pastorate. Well, that sounds familiar. Uh, I'm 32. Um, one man in the church, uh, a long-standing member who, though nice, regularly sowed seeds of discord. He was trying to restore things to the ways of the past when committees ran the church. He also began talking to other members, asking if they thought I needed to grow as a, as a preacher. Things escalated when he turned those conversations into a list of like-minded objectors which he planned to present at a business meeting, almost like a petition. I felt like I was in a tough spot. On the one hand, I always desired to improve in preaching. Yet on the other hand, I knew I couldn't really fight that battle. Our lead deacon at the time caught wind of the list and sprang into action. He assured me of his support, got a hold of the list, and proceeded to call the first five people on it. He asked what their concerns were and if they had issues with me. Then he asked why they hadn't directed the criticism to me personally instead of joining a grumbling group. These members were actually horrified when that they were on a list they didn't even know it existed. This deacon then called the man and told him that undermining the pastor was hurting the church and that he needed to stop and find a healthier, more biblical way to express his opinions. As it turned out, most of the folks on the list ended up communicating to me their trust and support rather than anything discouraging. The situation was totally diffused because one deacon had the wherewithal and courage to rise up and address a situation I couldn't. He protected the unity of the church at a pivotal moment. Now I'm in year 13, and I honestly think surviving years two and three would have been almost impossible without that deacon's support. So here's an example of a deacon coming in, and just like we saw in Acts 6, so the situation is different. This deacon is protecting the unity of the church right? It just looks different than how it looked in Act 6, but it's the same nugget, okay? This is what deacons do. Next one, I was a young pastor and the only, the only elder serving with the deacon board of eight. 
About a year into my pastorate, a deacon questioned a few, of a few decisions of the finance committee, which upset some ladies on it. Almost immediately, their husbands started demanding this deacon's resignation and pressuring me to make it happen. Earl, a respected patriarch in his 70s, was serving as the chairman of the deacons. He took me to lunch and looked me in the eye. Preacher, I don't know why people are saying what they're saying, but I want you to know I have your back. We're going to get through this. Let's pray. He then went to those men and stood in the gap, essentially taking the conflict for me. We're going to let our pastor lead, he told them. Had Deacon Earl not led the way in quelling that conflict, I doubt I would have survived there. I truly believe God used him to save my pastorate. But this wasn't the only way Deacon Earl strategically served. It's no secret that change can be hard for those who've been in the same church for decades. When our church started attracting younger folks and everything that can bring they, that and everything that anything they can bring with it, backward caps, noisy settings, and so on, he didn't fold his arms. He welcomed them with open arms. With his big mustache and even bigger smile, newcomers felt his warmth and love. Deacon Earl helped to turn the tide of the whole church. Deacon Earl's de death a couple years ago was one of the most bittersweet times in the life of our church, simply because of how beloved he was. He was a man who loved Jesus and couldn't wait to see him. Because, and, because Je and because he loved Jesus, he loved people. From the youngest to the oldest, everyone was attracted by this conflict-solving, change-embracing, people-loving deacon. Uh, let's look at a few more. A few more, and then we'll move on. It was a Sunday evening prayer service, and the senior pastor was spotlighting the ministry of a local crisis pregnancy center. They had contacted our church. Were any members able to meet with a couple who had decided to keep their unborn baby? My wife and I volunteered and met with Carla and her boyfriend several times. My wife and Carla became quite close. In fact, the boyfriend ended up leaving the picture. One of Carla's greatest needs was wise counsel. How in the world to raise a kid while working a job, arranging childcare, and attempting to stay sane? Amazingly, over the course of several months, Carla's heart warmed to Jesus Christ. She became a believer, was baptized, and became a member of our church. Of course, this enabled my wife and me to connect with her even more, with her, connect her with even more brothers and sisters in the church. We got a front row seat to watch her grow in the faith. To be sure, none of this happened immediately. It was probably a full year from the time we met Carla to the moment she embraced Christ. As one of our church's deacons for practical member care, I occasionally make a church-wide appeal. If anyone desires to serve with us or has extra resources you'd like to give to members in need, reach out and let us know. Well, a member contacted us to say that he was getting rid of a car, and rather than trading it in, he wanted to donate it to someone in the church. I was thus able to connect Carla with this generous church member who didn't yet know her, and she got a good working condition vehicle for free. It has been a privilege to walk with Carla through some of her darkest hours, especially early on. It certainly wasn't a quick fix, nor did, it, did we go it alone. I ran point as a deacon, yes, but the beautiful effort I got to spearhead was church-wide. Um, let's look at uh, two more, and then we'll move on, okay? Uh, but the others you can, you can look at on your own. Let's look at um, the next one. When Betty's husband started losing his mental faculties due to Parkinson's disease, she naturally felt overwhelmed, though she never complained. As a deacon, I reached out to recruit members to help her navigate this distressing stage of life. These folks serve in droves, helping her move furniture, sift through piles of basement junk, and even pull off two yard sales. Gratefully, my job gave me the flexibility to visit Betty often, sometimes just to chat. Deacons need not be gifted to teach, but they should be equipped to talk. I always had the privilege of meeting her two daughters. I also had the privilege of meeting her two daughters and sharing Christ with one of them. Betty faced a number of complicated financial decisions, from caring for her husband in his final months, to making funeral arrangements, to estimating personal health care costs, to eventually putting her house on the market. James 1.27 is clear. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. By God's grace, we were able to mobilize a James 1.27 ministry to Betty, reminding her often she was not forgotten and was deeply loved. 
All of this transpired, by the way, during a particularly tense season of racial unrest in America. Betty is an elderly white woman, and I'm a young black man. A friendship like ours might look strange, even scandalous, to a watching world. But the blood that unites us runs deeper than anything that divides us. Indeed, anything is possible in Christ. Let's go on and um, let's look at the last one. It says Tim Ellis, if you turn the page. And then you can read some of the other ones because I, I enjoy reading these. Um, Tim Ellis on the last page of um, this section. Tim Ellis was the quintessential church member and model servant respected by all. It seemed that he could do anything for anybody. Certainly, it seemed like a no-brainer to install him as a deacon. There was just one sticking point. His wife was previously divorced. Even though most would say her divorce was biblical, her previous husband had committed adultery, nonetheless, a cloud hovered over them both as several older members were unwilling to consider him for the office given the given their take on husband of one wife. Several leaders were frustrated by this vocal minority, but Tim wasn't. In fact, his attitude was incredible. Essentially, he said to us, it's fine. I understand. Sometimes we need to meet people where they are. I'll just serve like a deacon anyway. You don't have to give me the title. And this was not merely a nice sentiment. Tim served for years without any official title. When he was finally ordained as a deacon, it was a big win for the congregation, not to mention a prime teaching opportunity. Two years later, Tim died in a car accident, leaving behind his wife and two young children. Tim was my neighbor and one of my closest friends. His death and subsequent absence remains one of the hardest things I've ever walked through. What kind of a legacy did this deacon leave? To this day, there is a phrase that floats around our church, the Tim Ellis Principle. In other words, serve the Lord in whatever you do, regardless of whether anyone recognizes you. Or to put it another way, live like Tim, the man who deaconed long before his church gave him the title. Um, I would encourage you to look at some of those others that we skipped just for the sake of time and to, to read, because it really gives you a, an inside look into what deaconing looks like um, in a variety of other churches. But let's move on. Um, what I want you to see here is that deacons assist their pastors. They assist their pastors and enrich the life of the church in many ways, uh, in, in so many different ways, far beyond the examples here. But you can see organizing service, tackling tangible needs, shielding the ministry of the word, guarding the harmony of the flock, caring for the distressed, and so much more. Um, let's talk a little bit just briefly about um, what it is that deacons display to the congregation. Um, deacon ministry isn't glorious, okay? It's not glorious because it is always seen. Uh, it often isn't. Much of what deacon ministry is goes unseen. Uh, deacon ministry is not glorious because it often gratifies, at least not immediately. Sometimes deaconing is hard and it feels like a slog. Ultimately, deacon ministry is glorious because it mirrors Jesus Christ. And we can think of Jesus as the deacon of deacons, the servant of servants, in other words. Jesus was the servant of servants. Uh, Mark 10, we've looked at this passage quite a bit. I just want to read it to you again. Um, well, before, this is a, a quote from Smithers. When Jesus walked on the earth, the office of deacon did not exist, and yet his life had everything to do with it. Um, there were no deacons when Jesus was alive, um, but he embodied everything that a deacon is to embody. Uh, in Mark 10, 42, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you, he tells his disciples. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, must be your deacon. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served or deaconed, but to deacon and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus reverses what it means to be great. What does it mean to be great in the eyes of the world? Often it means have the most stuff, be the smartest, 
be the biggest influencer, be the richest, look the best. But Jesus reverses what it means to be great. And he does this by demonstration. He deacons, in other words. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to not be deaconed, but to deacon. He does this by demonstration. George Fuller says, place high value on the word deacon. It rises from the heart of the gospel. It's one of the very reasons why Jesus came. So place high value on that word. Um, there's another passage that I want to show you that it doesn't have the word or a related word to deacon, but you definitely see a portrait of Jesus deaconing. It's John 13. It's the passage where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. Um, look, it's in your notes. You can follow along with me, um, or it's on the screens as well. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world. Okay, mark that, all right? Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world. He knew that he was going to die. It was that time, okay? He was going to bear God's wrath for sin. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Mark that as well. Jesus is aware that's, that Judas is going to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal. Wait, pause, go back. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. What would you do if you had all things under your power? Look at this next verse. He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. This is the Jesus that the Father had put all things under his power. This is what Jesus does. That's pretty incredible. Um, there's a quote here from Tim Keller that I want you to catch. He's explaining, making some observations about what we just read. First of all, Jesus washed feet despite his impending death. Jesus was to have the wrath of God poured out on him. He was feeling the tremendous weight of that even at the supper. When we are hurting with a load of care on our backs, do we look around and notice that people's feet need to be washed? Do we look for the little ways to serve? No, we are usually absorbed in our troubles and we want people to take care of us. A real servant does not say, when I get my life together, when I get over my blues, when I get my schedule in order, then I will start to minister. Perhaps you are hurting and you may even be angry because no one is noticing. But where would you be if Jesus had your attitude? Second, Jesus served despite the unworthiness of the disciples. Notice John's reminder that Jesus knew the betrayer was present. Jesus saw them all, one betrayer, one denier, all forsakers. When he needed them most, they would leave him. One of those sets of feet was dirty and sore from an errand that arranged for his torture and death. What did Jesus do? He washed those feet. Wow. Let's talk a little bit about Jesus's ongoing deacon ministry and how it continues to play out within the church. Jesus's earthly ministry was mighty in word and deed. And Jesus continues that ministry today through elders and deacons in his church. So elders, same word for pastors, uh, elders, deacon, elders, pastors serve with words, primarily with words, the word ministry. They're deacons, servants of the word. Deacons serve with deeds, primarily. And the result is Christ's holistic ministry continues on. 
In other words, when you have pastors and deacons functioning as they should in the church, you end up displaying and continuing Christ's ministry that was both powerful in word and deed. Do you see that? How it continues on within the church? Um, and, and so what, what I want you to see from this is that deacon ministry is not mundane. It's in a very real sense messianic. It, 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 it derives, it's, it takes its shape and form and model from the example of the Messiah himself, the one who wrapped a towel around his waist and washed his disciples' feet, the one who said he came not to be deaconed, but to deacon himself. This is what deacon ministry does. Um, so this is a huge, huge thing. Um, now, I wanted to set that before us because before we start dealing with a, a particular issue that I think is important for us to consider, uh, I really wanted you guys to, uh, and all of us, myself included, to to see how amazing, how incredible, um, how Christ-like deacon ministry is, okay? It's it's an exalted thing, and I, and I wanted all of us to kind of be reminded of that. Um but I want to pivot a little bit now, and, and with the remainder of time that we have, I want us to ask a question. Uh, and if you got the email, you would have seen it uh, from the newsletter. We we're going to ask the question, are deaconesses, in other words, female deacons, biblical? Um, now, full disclosure, I have never grown up in a church with deaconesses, okay? I didn't grow up with women who served as deacons. I, I just haven't experience that in all the different churches that I've been in we never had that okay um so what what I what I'm having to do is I, I don't simply want to just perpetuate something because I've never seen it I I want to put the word in front of us and say what does the bible say about this first and foremost what does God's word say about deaconesses and then look at my past and look at our present and see what is it that we need to do okay so what i'm going to do in the remaining time that we have is i want to give you kind of both sides because there, there are two sides of this argument you have godly people on one hand that that say no deaconesses are not biblical and you have godly people on the other hand who say yes deaconesses are in fact biblical okay so we're not talking about the difference between heretics and people who are orthodox it's not it's not that, okay? We're not going to come to blows over deaconesses. Um, this is an inter-family dialogue, in other words. This is what we're talking about tonight. Um, so th there's a few words that I want to say before we get into the actual text. Sometimes people who are convinced that the Bible does not allow women to serve as deacons are accused of not valuing the ministry of women. In other words, you have an all-male deacon ministry, you must not care about women, okay? Sometimes that's what gets thrown out there. But this conclusion doesn't necessarily follow from the premise, okay? That's, that's not necessarily true. Women can, and in fact, many do flourish in churches without women deacons. Um, uh, of course... Um, oh, I was kind of fast. I'll give you time to write that in. Women can and many do flourish in churches without women deacons. Now, we, we do need to acknowledge that there is such a thing as chauvinistic churches. There are chauvinistic church leaders. That's a real thing, okay? I think we all know that. That exists. But what if a church chooses not to have deaconesses for carefully chosen, biblically grounded reasons. Is such a church and its leadership therefore anti-woman? I don't think so. I don't think so. If, if a church and, and its leadership and its pastors put the Bible in front of, and they, and they pray about it, they wrestle with this, and, and they're bound to say, well, I don't think deaconesses are biblical. I, that doesn't mean they're anti-woman, okay? I just want to make that statement. Um, there are churches without female deacons that equip and encourage women better than churches with them. And the women in those churches that have all male deacons are fully supportive. Uh, they're totally supportive of an all male deaconate. They're, they're not 
They don't feel slighted, in other words, okay? That exists, and we just need to acknowledge that before we dive in. Um, on the other hand, suppose that a church concludes, again, based on carefully looking at the Bible, um, that they should have deaconesses. Are we to say that is, is that kind of church bowing to cultural pressure or to social trends to flatten the created differences between men and women? Not necessarily. I don't think so. So we need to say that as well. All right. Um, many people, here's the truth, okay? Many people, both chauvinists on the one hand and feminists on the other, have pathetic reasons for why they believe what they believe about the role of women in the church, okay? Um, our goal here is to be done with pathetic reasoning. We, I don't want that for any of us, okay? Whatever we end up deciding that we believe, let's have a reason for why we believe it, okay? Um, our goal is to try to make the best sense of what scripture is saying and then apply its meaning in a way that maintains unity in the church, which after all is, is the whole goal of deacons, right? It would be pretty ironic if we're talking about deacons and then we end up destroying the unity of the church <laughs> when deacons are here for the unity of the church. So let's not do that. Um, again, like I said, godly brothers and sisters in the faith uh, and faithful churches differ on this matter an inter-family discussion. It's not an us versus them thing. We must tread carefully about whatever conclusions we make. All right, I think I've uh, made enough caveats. Now let's, let's go on. First, I'm going to show you some arguments against women deacons. So these are arguments that people will make, godly people who love the Lord, who love women, who love men, who want to be faithful to Christ, um, they'll use these arguments to say, no, we're not going to have female deacons here. You ready? This is what they'll say. Uh, first, um, oh, look at that. I didn't know you had it in there. First, your first one is this. The example that they'll point to is that in Acts 6, the Jerusalem church selected only men. They selected only men in Acts 6. That's when... Most of us agree this is when deacon ministry started. The text says, brothers and sisters, they're talking to the church, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of, of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them, and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. And so people will look at that and say, well, it seems pretty arbitrary to, to apply this so much from this passage to our church today. It's like, yes, we're going to say, let's prioritize scripture. Let's get the whole congregation involved. Let's stress the importance of character. But yeah, this whole selection of, of men only, let's not apply that. Okay? So that kind of seems on the face of it a little arbitrary, doesn't it? We're going to take all of it except this one little thing. We're not going to do that. Okay? That's one argument that people will make. All right. Again, this this is arguments against women deacons. Second one, um, people will say Paul referred to deacons' wives in First Timothy three, not deaconesses. And this will show up in different translations of the Bible, and you're going to see that tonight. Um, Paul referred to deacons' wives, not deaconesses. This is the argument that they will make. Let's read the text of 1 Timothy 3. This is the, where are we at? Uh, this is the ESV, okay? So let's look at this. 1 Timothy 3, starting verse 8. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Let them be tested first. And then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. We looked at all this last week when we were talking about qualifications. And then here's the verse, verse 11. Their wives, all right, there's, there's the Greek, gynakas, likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Um, and then verse 12, let deacons 
Each be the husband of one wife, managing their children in their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, there's the passage. And the argument goes, as you see in your notes, um, okay, yeah, that word there, gynakas, wives, women, it, it can be translated women, but the flow of the passage, these people would say, it seems to point more naturally to deacons' wives rather than just women in general. And here's where they, where they get this. So in the immediate context, the word shows up twice in verse 2 and in verse 12, and it's translated by most English translations, wife. Here it is. Here's 1 Timothy 3, 2. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. There's the word. Sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Okay, obviously, um, they're, they're looking at that and going, well, it shows up there, and it makes good sense to translate that wife instead of just women in the immediate context. Then drop down to verse 12. In your notes, you can see it. Um, verse 12, let deacons each be the husband of one wife. There it is again, managing their children and their own households well. So people will point to that fact. They'll also say this. Well, if Paul meant deaconesses, then why doesn't he just come out and say it? Why is he more ambiguous with women or wives, this more general word? Why doesn't he just say deaconesses? female deacon something like that to clarify why is it more why is it ambiguous um people will also say it's difficult to understand why paul would discuss male deacons in verses 8 through 10 then female deacons in verse 11 and then male deacons again in verse 12 such a reading gives the reader whiplash in other words you've got males oh well then we're going to talk about female deacons and then we're going to come back over here and talk about male deacons again it just seems like back and forth, back and forth. They'll look at that and say, look, the flow doesn't make sense. And so this is how they understand this passage, okay? So if, if you are opposed to deacons being women, this is the way that people would read it. First Timothy 3, 8, here's an outline. Here's the requirements for deacons in verses eight through 10, deacons' wives, verse 11, and then deacons again in 12 and 13. This is the way they see this passage, okay? Lots of people who love Jesus, who love his word, who love people, see it this way, okay? Um, they also say it's better to conclude that Paul is speaking of male deacons throughout, and he's examining one's family life from two angles. In verse 11, he's talking about the character of his wife, and in verse 12, his character as both husband and father in verse 12. And they'll look at that and say, this makes good sense, right? In light of, of being a deacon and in light of the fact that wives may be called on to assist their husbands, particularly in addressing the needs of the church's women, one could see why Paul would have desired that the church be satisfied with the character of a candidate and his wife as they assessed his suitability for deacon ministry. All right, makes sense. Deacons are going to do a lot of work, uh, sensitive work a lot of ministry toward women so we should care about the character of his wife that's what people are saying in this argument uh one other thing before we look at the arguments for women deacons uh, this is a lot and, and it's kind of technical but i'm hang in there with me because it, there's a lot to process and then next week we'll have a discussion okay but i i gotta i gotta feed you with all this stuff tonight and i hope that you chew on it throughout the week read through the notes again so that we can come back next week and have a good talk okay so hang in there um i know it's kind of dense but this is important the the third thing people will point to is phoebe is this woman in in romans 16 they'll they'll say she was a servant not a deacon remember we've already talked about in previous weeks deacon means servant right and they'll say there's no need to call her a deacon she's just a servant let me show you. You'll see this in the difference between the ESV, English Standard Version, and the NIV, the New International Version, okay? There's, there's a difference here. Here's the ESV, Romans 16, 1 and 2. Paul says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a diakonos, a servant, the ESV says, of the church at Sincrea, all right? Now let's look at the NIV. 
I commend to you our sister Phoebe A. Deacon, Diakonos. Okay, same word, but different translation, depending on the ESV or the NIV. You can see it in your notes there. So, um, yeah, you, you've got the same word there, diakonos, but we know people will say from the rest of the New Testament, as we've seen, that word can be used informally. Jesus wasn't a deacon, but he says, oh, I came to deacon, right? So he's using it generally like a servant. So people will look at this passage who say, no, women can't be deacons. And they'll say, really what Paul's saying is that um, Phoebe is ministry minded or she has a servant's heart, for example. This is, this is really what Paul's getting at. There's no need um, to make Phoebe out to be a deacon. And, and so you have the ESV saying that. Okay, makes sense with me? Okay, um, last point that you'll hear for people who are opposed to deaconesses. Deacon ministry entails a measure of authority. Um, and, and then people will point to uh, this text in 1 Timothy 2. It says, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And so people will say, well, some measure of authority is going to be given to this woman. Any woman who deacons well is going to have some authority. Um, excuse me. To, to open the deacon, the deacon ministry to women is, in, in their view, not, not just unbiblical, it's also unwise, for they will inevitably take on a level of practical authority that Scripture forbids. So um, there you have it. Those are arguments that you'll encounter by godly people who love God's word and who, who love women and who love his church, but say, no, deacons must be male. Okay? Now let's look at arguments for women deacons. Hang in with me. I know it's dense, but it will make our conversation next week um, much more interesting. There's a little star here by the word for, and I, and I want to be clear here for a second. The arguments that we're about to read assume that deacons in our church function like deacons and not like um, elders and pastors, okay? That's, that's really important. Um, churches whose deacons function like a governing board of overseers who keep the pastors in check or exercise some kind of authority to make decisions within the the church regarding spiritual matters, those types of churches and those deacons need to go back and study what is it that deacons are supposed to be doing, um, wrestle with that first, and, and then implement that um, before we start talking about can women be deacons, okay? And that's an important caveat. Um, let's, uh, let's move on. So first point, arguments for women deacons. Scripture nowhere forbids deaconesses, okay? You won't see a verse that says, thou shalt not have deaconesses. That's not in the Bible. Um, now, we got to talk about this for a second, because we just read that verse. I don't permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Let's talk about this for a second. Um, I think what Paul's getting at here is... is He's talking more about elders or pastors. He's not talking about deacons and deacon ministry, okay? So we just spent six months of the church going through gender and sexuality where we spent a considerable amount of time on the roles of women within the church and the roles of men within the church. We've already, I've talked about that a ton. If you have questions about that, you want to talk more about that, let's do it. Let's just not do it here. We've, we've done it for six months, okay? Okay. Um, so I, I don't want to rehash old old things, but what I think Paul has in view here is primarily saying that that women are not to be elders or pastors. Okay, um, elders and pastors are uniquely charged with teaching and giving spiritual oversight to the whole church. To be sure, deacons will need to make decisions about resources, call up on others for help, and generally manage areas of tangible need. But unlike elders, deacons are not charged with shepherding the whole flock. Okay. 
there's, there's a difference in responsibility between a pastor and a deacon. Uh, unlike elders and pastors, deacons do not need to be ready to stand and give instruction in sound doctrine and rebuke those who contradict it. Pastors and elders are. Um, that's a requirement for being an elder. You need to be able to rebuke people who contradict sound doctrine. That's according to Titus 1.9. Okay, deacons don't have to be ready to do that. It's a plus, but you don't have to be able to do that. Uh, never once do we read, be subject to your deacons. Uh, you do read that about elders in 1 Timothy 5. Uh, we never read, obey your deacons and submit to them. Um, but as I said, you do see this in Hebrews 13. Um, as you can see for yourself there. So what we have here in, in 1 Timothy 2, it doesn't seem to rule out women from serving in deacon ministry um, on account of whatever authority they would gain from serving well, but rather elder and pastoral ministry. Does that make sense? It's a difference there. Uh, and the question that we need to ask ourselves is, why do we forbid what the Bible doesn't? Okay, now let's look a little bit more of this passage, um, this whole business of their wives versus women. We got to deal with that a little bit, okay? So the argument that people will make is that actually Paul is referring to deaconesses, not deacons' wives in 1 Timothy 3. Okay, now follow along with me in your notes here. You'll see this in the differences again in English translations. The ESV says this. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Okay, that's the ESV. I love the ESV, by the way. I preach from the ESV every Sunday. Okay, I'm not slamming the ESV. Every translation, no translation in English is perfect. You, you try to move, you, you try to interpret from one language to another. There's some words that are going to be you know, there's going to be some massaging there, okay? No languages one-to-one, -one, especially a language that's ancient from one that's modern, okay? There's, there's, the translations are good. I'm not sowing doubt in your mind, like I can't trust my Bible. You can trust your Bible, okay? We're talking about, a, we're, we're kind of splitting hairs a little bit tonight, okay? Um, now, look at the NASB, 311. Women, do you see that, the difference? Women, the ESV says their wives. The NASB says women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Now, let's look at the Greek. I've got it spread out there for you. Um, notice what you have. You have the word that we've been looking at, gunaikos. Where's the there? Do you see it? The ESV says their wives. Where is there in Greek? It's not there. It's not there. Okay? So what you have is this is an interpretation more than a translation, at least at right here. Does that make sense, the difference there? They're making an interpretation, which godly people believe this, but it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one translation. Uh, more literally, just women, likewise, must be dignified, okay? Uh, so other things that we need to see here. Remember, 1 Timothy is a letter, and there's actually five other instances of this word popping up in this letter before we ever get to 1 Timothy 3, okay? In every instance here, it's best translated women in general, not wives. Let me show you. 2.9, Paul says, likewise, that women... Uh, should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty, self-control, okay? He's talking about how women in general should, should carry themselves within the church. He's not talking about wives. But it's the same word, right? 2.10, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness. Not wives, just women. Second one, this is the third one. He says, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. He's not talking about husbands and wives. He's just talking about women in general in the church. Uh, 2.12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Again, he's not talking about husbands and wives, just women. Number five, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Okay, so 
all of these instances of gynaikos are best translated woman whether that rather than wife so what we need to ask ourselves is why is there a sudden shift now that we get to chapter three why are we changing it to wife are you with me so you've got uh, an overseer must be above reproach the husband of one wife and then 311 their wives must be dignified and then 312 deacons must be the husband of one wife but what i want us to see is doesn't woman or women seem more consistent with the rest of the letter in comparison to what we've what we've been encountering throughout the whole letter when we get to chapter three does it seem more consistent um next the the translation husband of one wife also, if we're going to take it that way, it seems to overly restrict elders and deacons to being married. Now, think about this for a second. If an elder or a deacon must be the husband of one wife rather than one woman man, Jesus or Paul wouldn't be able to be a deacon or an elder because neither one of them were married. Does that make sense? So how, what's the best translation here? But if Paul intends one woman man rather than wives or husband of one wife, the single and widowed people who likewise demonstrate a life above reproach, they are in fact eligible for office. See, the, the point is, I, I think that a person, a man's fidelity should be broadly known and uncontroversial, not that he must be married. Single people, widowed people can be um, deacons, they not to be married to be a deacon right? So, um, also notice here, I, we've already said this, the ESV says their wives must be dignified, but the word there is absent in Greek, and I've included that so that you can see it. It's an interpretation rather than a translation. Uh, and then here's, here's another thing we need to consider. If deacons' wives were meant to be understood here rather than female deacons, shouldn't we expect the word there or something similar to be present? Now, as, as far as the, the whiplash argument goes, remember what I said earlier? Paul's talking about uh, males and then female deacons and then male deacons. It just seems like back and forth, like kind of getting whiplash here. What, what's the flow here? You can easily understand the passage this way, and I've included it in your notes so you can you can see it and understand it this way. Deacon, deacons, uh, we're talking about requirements for deacons and deaconesses, just general requirements in verses 8 through 10. And then Paul's going to focus specifically for women, and then he's going to focus specifically for men, and then he's going to come back and then cap it all off again, generally, generally speaking, for deacons and deaconesses. In other words, it still makes sense. It still makes sense in this reading. It's still faithful. Um, hang with me. We're almost done. I know it's dense. Hang with me. What, what's happening here is that Paul bookends his talk about deacons with general statements for all deacons. And then inside the bookends are specifics. You've got female deacons being mentioned in 311 and then male deacons in verse 12. And here's, here's the last point, and then we'll move on to Phoebe, and then we'll be done. And some of you will be like, praise the Lord, we're done with this. <laughs> um, I, I, want to, I want to be clear. I want to give you all the stuff so you can let this marinate in your mind for a week before we come and, and talk about it. Lastly, if, if we're reading our Bible, and I've got my ESV here, and I'm reading, and it says their wives, when it's talking about deacons, and I understand, okay, deacons' wives are what he's talking about. If that's what Paul intends, rather than women, female deacons, um, why would Paul list the qualifications for deacons' wives, but not elders' and pastors' wives? You see that? There is no qualification for women in, in the list when he's talking about pastors or elders. Now, if the character of a deacon's wife was so important for Paul to add to the list of requirements, one would expect the character of pastor's wives, that would be included as well, but it's not. So 
So in other words, it makes little sense to think that Paul thought the wives of the church's servants should receive scrutiny, but not the wives of its leaders. And I think in, in my reading, um, and, and there are lots of people I, I love and respect that disagree, but at least it seems like it seems to make sense that Paul's talking about deaconesses and not their wives when you look at all of this stuff. Um, let's look at Phoebe. Um, people who believe that that um, women can be deacons, uh, they'll look at Phoebe and say, no, she was a deacon, not merely a servant. It's not that she just had a servant heart, but she was in fact a deacon. So again, the difference here, NIV, ESV, deacon versus servant. But I don't want to deal with that word because, I mean, it's, it's the same word. It's just a, a choice of translation. What I want you to look at here is a deacon or a servant, but look at this, of the church in Sincrea, of the church in Sincrea. Um, now, it's, I think it's significant that Phoebe is called the deacon, servant, whatever, of specific local church, okay? If Paul was just generally, in my view, was just generally saying, Phoebe, who's got a servant's heart, uh, I, I think there's there's little need to put of specific location. But when I see this and I think of specific location, what he's doing is that he's showing that Phoebe seems to be holding a formal office in a local church rather than just um, she's she's got a servant's heart. Okay. Now, again, there are godly people that disagree with that and say, no, she's just a servant. There are countless servants of the church, but it seems that Phoebe holds formal office of a local church, a deacon of the church of Sincrea. Lastly, um, I want you to see, and we'll be done. There is historical precedent for deaconesses in the church. What I, what I don't want to come away with tonight and just say, oh, I knew we hired this young guy who's going to come in and uh, bow to cultural pressures, and, and now we're going to be drifting towards liberalism and whatever else. Okay, look, if you think that's me, uh, you don't know me very well yet. What, what I care about is what does this say? What, what makes the most sense here, okay? Um, and I've, I've already stood my ground um, for the past six months on some pretty hot button issues. And I, I kept appealing back to this. Um, and, and I've already made it clear here tonight that I believe that, that the, the office of being a pastor or an elder is reserved for men. That's, that's based on, I can point you to multiple verses, okay? Not just one. I believe that wholeheartedly, okay? Um, but, but I think there's more to this deaconess thing biblically that we really need to consider. And I want you to look at this and I want you to wrestle with this this week, okay? And I want you to see that it's not a recent trend, okay? I'm not being trendy. I'm not trendy. Um, Pliny the Younger, okay? It just, we'll do this and we'll be done. Uh, he wrote a letter to the Roman emperor. Look at the date, okay? 111, 113. In that letter, he wrote to the Roman emperor um, that he's trying to figure out what's this whole Christianity business. He, he's a governor of Rome, a pagan, and he's trying to figure out what are these Christians? What is it they believe? And so he grabs these two ladies who are in a part of a church and he tortures them to try to get the truth out of them. Um, and these two ladies that he writes about were called deaconesses in the church. Were they servants or were they deacons? This is pretty early, okay, 111. You have what's this, this is called the Apostolic Constitutions. This was written around 380, again, very late. You can read that for yourself, but basically it's an ordination for deaconesses, okay? That's uh, 1,700 years old. Uh, and then let's look over here. You have John Chrysostom. You can see when he lived, he took 1 Timothy 3.11 as deaconesses 1,700 years ago. 
you have Jerome, again, he mentions a woman named Salvina, who is a deaconess. You have John Calvin, which was uh, 1500s, and he holds to deaconesses. Um, if you want a Baptist, Charles Spurgeon had deaconesses, okay? So again, you have godly people throughout the eras that said no, just like you have godly people today that say no. This doesn't need to cause a rift, doesn't need to be, we don't need to come to blows. What I want us to do is, this is how we're going to end. Deaconesses or not, what will we do? Uh, there's room for both conclusions within the church. The question is, what will be the practice at our church? And this is what I want you to wrestle with, with your Bibles open, with these notes before you. Do some of your own thinking and your own reading and your own praying. And when we come back next week, we're going to just have a discussion time. We're going to discuss this together, see what you think, um, and we'll go from there. Okay? Make sense? Let me pray for us, and we'll be all done. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Let's pray. We'll pray for the DR team. Okay. Father, thank you so much for this time. Uh, I, I thank you that we could kind of slog it out a little bit tonight and, and look through some, some granular uh, issues and details about an important passage related to deacons. And I pray in the coming weeks, Lord, that you would help us all to wrestle with what is it that your word is saying? What is it that our conscience allows? Um, does our conscience need to be informed more by God's word? Um, Father, is, is our current practice of deacons and, and who can be a deacon and what deacons do? How, how can we further align that with your word? I pray that you would give us wisdom. Um, and I pray, Lord, that this would be a, a healthy exercise for all of us as a church and, and that we would think about this and pray about this and be ready to come back um, next week to discuss and dialogue about this together. And we pray that you would be pleased by this. And we pray for the, the DR team that just arrived in Florida. I thank you that you kept them safe. And I ask, Lord, that you would help them to minister to people who right now, help them, Lord, to deacon in a real way um, to people who are suffering the effects of an, an awful storm in Florida. Would you give them grace and, and give them opportunity to spread the word? And um, would you grow the kingdom of God through their ministry? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Thank you.